Share my screen again. Okay. Can I can I get any any confirmation that um, the screen is shared and things are working? <laughs> can can someone confirm this? Uh, I can see your screen. But you, you you're online, okay, so so I would like uh, to know if people um in the meeting room are able to hear me and see me. Before I just start, <laughs> no, okay. no one no one can follow. Yeah. Ah, they are muted. That's why we can't hear them. They are on mute. W would you maybe if they unmute? Them? We say both. Please, please okay. continue. Okay. Right. Yeah. Very good. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm I'm Martin Brandt, associate professor at the University of Copenhagen, and I will um talk a bit about um, our work we are doing here in Copenhagen. I will give a bit an overview, and then um, Florian and Maurice they they will go into detail and um, give some some um, more uh, depth about about our ongoing work. So um so who are we? We we are um. Part of the geography, we, we are a remote sensing group, and then we are another subgroup of the remote sensing group, and we are specialized on the mapping of trees and, and tree characteristics. So we are relatively many people. It's this is only a fraction of the people on, on the screen, and it's um, something around plus minus 15 people right now, and they are all we are all concentrating on on one topic. And how how can we um, best describe what we are doing? We are trying or we are mapping trees over areas as large as possible and with as many details as possible. So this is an example from Denmark where we are located. And this example, you can already see that we have basically captured every tree. Um, or this is the aim. We want to capture every tree and we also attribute carbon stocks and height to, to every tree. So what we what we just published in Nature, and it was also on the cover, um, I think maybe two weeks ago, um, here we mapped um, 15 billion individual trees over the entire Sahel area and Sahara. It's it's a, an area of, of 10 million square kilometer. You can already see that we are not just mapping the trees, but we also we give them a color, the color of, so we want to give each tree uh, um, a meaning. And that I will explain a bit later. And these stories, they they went over many newspapers. So we had already two two um, uh, nature papers on this, and they were published in a lot of newspapers, like the Guardian and and, and BBC. And so it, it got very very popular. Um, the work we we did over the last weeks, um, uh, years. Sorry. And so why why are we mapping trees? Why are we doing these things? It is um, especially in the, in the context of Africa. Many trees are planted, but it is relatively unknown um, how many of these planted trees survive. Then we want to know the carbon stocks, which is also, especially in Africa, not easy to, to map carbon stocks of trees which are not growing in a forest. Each tree has a value. They have economic, ecological values for the people, also foods that are sold. So there's a lot of things that um, the trees provide. And all these things, they are normally um, measured and, and assessed via fieldwork. But it is relatively difficult with field work to go over large areas and also to repeat this over time. So we are using satellite images. Satellite images can be used to, to scale um, information from, from, from a tree to large areas and you can repeat it. So you can have wall to wall maps um, derived from satellite images and you can repeat it at different time steps like annual or even, even um, monthly or weekly. But current um, maps based on satellite images, um, they, they are full of issues. There are global um, tree cover maps, there are local tree cover maps, but there's a lot of um, uncertainty in these maps, especially if you go to areas where um, you do not have forests, but you have um, trees outside forests which are scattered. Like what in this example below, we have um, we are showing uh, an area of scattered trees um, overlain with the Hansen map, and, and it's rather random what is mapped. So it's not really mapping um, the reality and these maps cannot be really used if there is no closed canopy. Moreover, these these maps they do not really provide any information on on carbon stocks, on on species, or on any any um, ecological or economic values of single trees. So th so so these scattered trees they are largely missed in in these global maps. Why is this a problem? Because um, normally you're using satellite images where where a grid is um, a square here, and it's it's easy. Um, if there's a forest, like in the middle, this is very clear, it's a forest pixel, you can map this as a forest. If it's not a forest, it's also very clear, you map it as no forest. But if trees are scattered, like in large areas of Africa, then it's very difficult. These are not forests. And the satellite um, images with this kind of resolution, they normally fail of mapping anything in these areas. 
And these areas where trees are scattered, they are um, covering huge areas in the world. So it's, it's Africa, but also in other continents, Australia and, and also Europe. Many of these areas are, um, uh, um, many areas have scattered trees. And global maps, they map basically no trees in these areas. But we, we started looking in these areas and there are trees. We all know there are many trees in dryland areas. So the way forward is to increase the resolution. We are not using these um, relatively um, coarse resolution satellite images like like if it's 10 meter I also also say already say it's it's a relatively coarse resolution so we really want to use very high resolution images and we're using deep learning methods which are based on artificial intelligence to go to a level of detail um, which is necessary to map these kind of trees that are not growing outside of forest areas that is a result um, that is in, in West Africa, it, it, I think it looks very beautiful. You can see that every tree is mapped and every tree has a color. And the color is the carbon stock. So from, from the ground area, we, we know um, or we, we, we see the ground area and then we have a lot of field measurements and then we relate the ground area with the carbon stock. So we can derive a carbon stock for, for every tree. So these are allometric equations that from field data that we have collected in, in the Sahel area. And we can then estimate the wood mass, which is um, most of the biomass or the carbon stock, the root mass, which is below ground, and also the, the leaf mass, the foliage mass of the trees, which have a high potential for, for um, as fodder for animals. So we have mapped now these 15 billion trees, which I showed before, and um, we, can, we can derive a lot of very interesting statistics. We have also made a viewer where you can um, open it in the internet and you can click on every tree and then you can see the carbon stock. And later, um, Maurice will also show where, how you can access this viewer. So, so what we are doing to, to estimate carbon stocks now for, for a larger area is we aggregate from the tree level. We first we map the tree as individual, then we attribute a carbon stock, and then we sum it up. We sum the, the carbon stocks of every tree over, over the hectare, over one hectare, or any, any resolution that, um, that is desired. And then we have carbon stock maps for, for large areas in entire countries. We can do this also um, for, for different periods, like this is um, an area in Senegal, it's, it's a difference of 20 years. And you can see um, that in this field, it's a farmland field, a lot of trees have, um, have grown and, and have been planted, and also existing trees, they have grown in size. And we can now estimate the change um, of these tree plantations and carbon stocks. So, so many people may say, yeah, this is very easy if you are working in dryland areas where trees are scattered. That is not a big challenge, but how does this work if you go to a tropical forest, like, like rainforest, that is what Maurice will present later. Then we are also have, we have people who are doing this work in, in Europe, in, in, in Denmark, in, in France, in Finland, but I think this is for this workshop um, not of the main interest. Then we also want to, to see what kind of trees are growing. So if the trees, if the species are very characteristic, like the baobab, which is um, I think for most, most people, they can recognize a baobab tree. Then we can also do this from the satellite. So we can also localize um, different tree species. Mm, but using, using all these images is um, for a country like Rwanda or Denmark, it is, it is um, not very difficult because the countries are, are very small. But if you have a country like Tanzania, it gets relatively difficult to have country coverage every year at this um, spatial resolution. And it's, it's also very expensive. Here the solution is to use um, nano satellite data. This is um, it's it's very small satellites like on this photo below. You can hold it in your hand, the satellite, and they deliver every day um, global coverage, high resolution satellite images, which are relatively cheap. And Florian will present later after me on on this topic. There's an example of um, above is Landsat and below is Planet. You can you do not see this level of details um, from that I showed before in images, but still I think it's it's still possible to see individual trees. And if a tree is removed, you will see this. So what what are we doing to summarize it if, if everything um, together? We are tracking individual trees, and we can depending on the image source, we can go down to about a, a square meter ground size. So it's really tiny small trees and shrubs. We can we can go down to track them as individuals if the image quality is good. And then we are using field data. Um, from, from plots, and then we upscale um, these. We, we can upscale this field data using satellite images. So we get a lot of information on carbon stocks, on, on other values um, where we normally only have for plots, but now we can have it for the entire country. And um, most important is probably the carbon stock, which is um, then available for, for each single tree. And these things, um, as, as Maurice will then show, um, 
in, in the third presentation um, works for, for all kinds of ecosystem, like it's, if it's a forest or if it's a farmland, it, it will work in, in both cases. And um, yeah, it's, it's relatively quick, so we can, we can run an entire country um, if everything is, is done in, in a few hours or days. So we want to make use of new technologies. It is, this, this is um, relatively new and um, it requires um, some data and processing power, but um, we, want, we want these technologies to be used. We want it to be implemented in, um, in, in, in the real world to go beyond science. And, and we, we think um, that um, it, there's a big chance um, of applying these things to, to um, uh, um, steer better towards climate change mitigation and adaptation. And that is my last slide. I will give um, the floor now to Florian, who will um, go a bit more into details for um, the use of planet imagery. I will stop sharing. All right. Uh, hi, everyone. Let me share my screen as well. Um, Second. All right. Um, can you see my presentation? All right. So my name is Florian. I'm a PhD student at the University of Copenhagen as well, working closely with Martin and Maurice. And um, Martin's given a very good introduction. I will continue a bit um, on the topic of mapping tree cover, um, looking at a continental scale, looking at mapping all Africa. And in the beginning, um, our, our background is, as Martin said, that we're looking mostly at trees outside forest because these have not been mapped before. And we think they're very important for mapping carbon, for mapping their uses by communities, by people, and for mapping restoration efforts. And as said, these existing forest cover maps don't really include trees outside forest. And this is due to the limits of the resolution, so that it's not possible to see them. But at the same time, they're very important because they are the dominant form of tree cover in drylands. And these drylands cover up to 30% of the world land area. And especially in Africa, we can see it's the whole Sahel. These trees are really the dominant form of tree cover. And as um, Martin has also presented, we now have here at this university, but also in other institutions, um, there are now new methods available, such as machine learning, that allow the mapping of single individual trees if we have very high resolution data. And this is one of the key questions is the data, what images we have available. So in the case of Rwanda, we had aerial images available at very high resolution, 25 centimeter pixel but it's not always available and it's often very expensive to fly a plane and capture this imagery of a large area. And so the, the method is ultimately limited by the data. And if we want to go to continental level, we cannot get these aerial images. And also the, while there are other satellite images with the same resolution, they are very expensive, the, the world view, 50 centimeter. So instead what we've been looking at is working with a different data source, which is called PlanetScope which are these nanosatellites where the idea is to have many, many small satellites that are working together in a constellation. So there's an American company, Planet, that operates the PlanetScope constellation with about 200 of these satellites, and they capture imagery at three meter resolution um, for the whole world. And three meter resolution, it turns out, is actually very good um, compared to the existing products, and it's good enough to map single large trees. So you can see an example here again in the bottom right is the planet scope. Um, but of course, it's not exactly the same as 25 centimeter or 50 centimeters. So we cannot map all the smallest trees and it gets more difficult when the trees are close together. But we wanted to try and see how far we can get. So in my project here, um, the question was if we can map single trees at, at the whole continental level. And to do that, um, the project basically consists of three stages. We have the, the raw data, which is a lot of satellite scenes coming from this constellation. Then we have a machine learning network, which we train with training data where we manually have to label tree cover. So we label which parts of the image we think are a tree and which are background. 
and then we get predictions by the model, which are of two classes, if it's a tree or not in the image. And then we finally scale that up. So we want to predict a very large area and make a continental map of tree cover. And the, the, one of the main challenges in this task has been to prepare the data um, because it's a very big area and a high resolution. So it's a lot of, a lot of satellite data. And this data consists of scenes that are um, about 25 kilometers wide and we have four bands. It's quite important that we have the infrared band as well as the visual so that we can see infrared of the vegetation. And for example, this is one scene in Burkina Faso. That's how the size of one single scene. And then we want to cover all Africa so we can imagine it will be many, many of these scenes that we need to process. It's about 200,000 scenes that we have to combine. And if we zoom in on the scene, we can see um, some details which are not that clear. But then if we stretch it or if we look in the infrared, suddenly we can see that these are trees with a red infrared signal and a black shadow. And then we can use our machine learning model to get a, an approximate mapping of the trees, which um, even on the very high resolution on the Google Maps um, looks like an accurate representation of the trees. And then to, to do this at large scale, we had to prepare a lot of data. So we downloaded thousands of raw scenes and combined them into mosaics. Um, we automatically choose scenes based on a few criteria, and then we merge them into a seamless mosaic. Um, this is a rough idea of the kind of scene footprints coming in a 100 by 100 kilometer tile, and then we get this mosaic, and then we merge it into a smoother mosaic. And then once we have our data, we, oh, my presentation just crashed one second. Um, I think that video was not a good idea. Um, let's see. Can you see the presentation here? Yep. All right. Once we have the, um, the data ready, we use a machine learning model to prepare, to, to train it. So we, we prepare a lot of manual labels. We label each tree and the tree clusters. And then we train this model with training data from all over Africa so that it can be robust and handle situations um, in different e ecosystems and different um, rainfall zones. And the final result is that we get a, a tree cover map, which is actually at between one and three meter resolution of a single year. So we did this for the year 2019. And this works across many, many different types of environments. Um, from scattered trees to urban trees to semi-dense woodlands and all the way to forest, which is mapped as solid cover. And one nice thing about this is really that it's consistent between countries. So because it's the same data source for all countries, we can give a comparable number of tree cover um, that was measured in the same way compared to, say, national forest inventories. And if we want to look at some examples, um, here are some prediction examples overlaid on Google Maps. So this is on a, on a very high resolution background image, which was not used to predict the tree cover. It was predicted on the three meter image. And it shows these are the, the kind of easy case of scattered trees in, in Senegal or in Nigeria on fields. Um, we also can map individual trees in villages or in, in cities. And finally, as we get to more dense uh, woodlands, the Biombo in Angola, or this shifting cultivation, or yeah, um, a mix of woodlands and agriculture, um, we can see that it handles both scenarios in the tree cover map. And when we get to forest, we map it as continuous cover. So you can see some gaps in the forest, and on the left you can see a plantation with lots of logging roads, a eucalyptus plantation. What we then did is we took all this map tree cover um, data and did some analyses at a continental level. And we find that if we compare to existing tree cover maps, like the Hansen map, we find a lot of new tree cover, especially in the areas with low rainfall. So on the left chart, we see that um, the Hansen rain tree cover is shown in a gray line. And especially in the areas below 800 or below 600 millimeters rainfall, that's actually the new tree cover of trees outside forests that's the dominant cover. And similarly, if we compare to land cover products like the world cover map, we can see that um, actually nearly 30% of, of the trees we find are in areas that are not classified as forest which really shows the, the importance of these non-forest trees in Africa. And in, in terms of validation, we validated our tree cover map by comparing the, the predictions to LIDAR maps, which we have for a few sites, for a few small areas. So we have some field LIDAR that has the height um, of all vegetation in a given area. 
and then that's shown in the top row in blue and yellow. And then in the middle row, that's shown as the our predictions, which are two classes, trees or no trees. And if we compare these, we find that we are actually mapping um, trees of about five to six meter height and above. That's what we see that our product that our map picks up from the lidar. And this is quite a nice um, this is quite a nice confirmation to know that we are we are mapping trees and not not only not shrubs and not only very large trees. And in conclusion, um, what we've produced here is a, is a high resolution map of all forest and non forest trees for the for a continental scale. And it's consistent between countries, which means that it's possible to do consistent measurement, reporting, and verification at national scales. One thing to note here is that this is a, a map for one year, for 2019. So there's no change yet. We, we cannot go too far back in time because the satellite constellation is quite new. And we haven't yet done um, that much work on change. But in theory, it's possible to do, to do it again for later years and then compare the change um, if new trees are growing or removed. And another thing um, Maurice will present soon on, on Rwanda, and he's done some really good work on mapping the carbon of each tree. And here at, at African level, we don't yet have the biomass or carbon because the, the planet predictions are not yet always, um, we cannot split trees in a forest, so we cannot do allometry. The allometry approach is not valid yet. So this will require the height. Um, we would need the height of the trees as well. This is ongoing work another colleague is working on um, where we train our models with LIDAR data to try and predict the height as well. So that will come out in the future at some point. Um, one thing I can do now is to um, maybe show you a little bit of a demonstration of what the data looks like. Let me just see if I'm still, I can share a different screen. Um, let me, yeah. So I'm not sure if my screen is visible. Or is, is it? Yeah. yeah. So here's an, an example of um, this is the, the final output map as a percent tree cover, yellow being 100% tree cover and blue being no tree cover. And as we zoom in um, in different places, we note that even here in, in Senegal, where there's overall no dense forest, the tree cover is quite low. If we zoom in further, we can start seeing details of um, single trees appearing. And it's quite, um, and this works pretty much anywhere um, that we want to zoom in. Maybe I should go a bit slower, but we can kind of choose an area and see these individual trees being mapped as a, in green. And then this is now, we can also look at other areas. I'm not sure where exactly would be interesting. But we go to more dense vegetation here. Um, this is at the border of Senegal and southeast. We can see these kind of transitions between forests, woodlands, and single trees. If we go to maybe more in, in Tanzania, but closer to this workshop, um, we can also see these areas of, of forests, mapped as solid forests, and then the transition to, to single trees. Um, outside the forest. And yeah, I think I'm not sure how good this is loading over the Zoom. And unfortunately, this is not, we cannot make this accessible right now outside our network. Um, but at some point, this data will be available. And yeah, I think that's it for now. I will head over to Maurice. Um, Great. Yeah, I will share my screen. Uh, let me see if I figure out where the share is. Uh, okay, share. Share screen. Uh, right. Yeah, can, can you see my screen? Yeah. yeah. Yes, please proceed. 
Okay, great. Yeah, thanks a lot to Martin and Florian for the introduction and the great work that they've presented. So I will probably not go in, in more uh, technical parts, um, but I will uh, give you um, insights about what we've done in Rwanda, where we also did um, a work similar to what has been presented. But here we are mapping now um, single trees. Uh, both inside and outside forests, so in all ecosystems available. And why we did in we worked in Rwanda, it's besides that the images were available there, but actually the country has this heterogeneity, which corresponds to many ecosystems available in the tropics. So in for in rainforest, uh, farmlands, urban tree ecosystems, agroforestry, shrublands, uh, savanna. Yeah, and and then if we could map all trees within all of these ecosystems, we were convinced then that the method could be easily transferable. But why um, why is it important that we talk about the trees? So when we look at the uh, political pledges in many countries, uh, in the um, mitigation of <clears throat> climate change and also uh, saving the biodiversity from the loss that it's been going through, many countries are pledging to plant trees. So it's not the only way of getting carbon dioxide stored down. There are many ways like direct capture and, and others. Also the peatlands, the ocean, uh, all of these ecosystems store carbon. But here, many countries are now pledging to uh, plant more trees. So here's an example in Ethiopia, they, pl they pledged about 20 billion in 2019. And other countries like Pakistan, 10 billion trees, and many other like here in Europe, uh, 3 billion trees uh, by 2030. And um, in Rwanda, uh, some, a few millions uh, to plant. And now we have some global uh, platforms. But now we ask, how do we track the trees that are being planted? How do we know how many have survived and how much of impact they have? So in terms of biodiversity, the carbon stock, um, and, and so and so on. So here, an example of Rwanda, they are uh, some national targets, like 30% of the country to be covered by forests by 2020. This has been achieved by 2019. In, um, under the Bond Challenge, they pledged to restore about 80% of the country, and most of the activities are for planting trees. They also intended to reduce the carbon, uh, the emissions by 38%. So now, um, by going there, we want to see how these pledges are making an impact in terms of trees where they are and how much is the impact. Luckily, the technology is now allowing us to do so as it has been presented. I won't delay on this. Uh, so the technology, the method approach is not so different. Uh, also from hand drawn labels using very high resolution images to upscale to, and, and here in, in the case of Rwanda, we had two main outcomes. So the one is the individual tree crown dimension. So we want to know the location of the tree, the size of the, the, the crown of the tree, and, uh, and then also the crown dimensions like diameter, the shape, and, and tree density, and also the cover. So that's one uh, main bigger output. A second output is the individual tree level biomass and the carbon stock. So another output that we've done is now towards the monitoring. So we went from images from 2008 to images to 2019 to see how many trees were being added every year in Rwanda uh, on average. And, and that's what we've done. So here we have an example of how the national tree density looks like. And here at the top left uh, corner, we are comparing with the existing tree cover map from 2013. The images here we used were from 2008. I will present later what we are doing with 2019. But then we can see that because our myth, with our methods, we can map not only forest trees, but also trees outside forests as um, has been shown already. So now that we can see that the density has increased. So we are talking about the density of both of trees, both inside and outside forest. And actually here we found that about 38% of all trees in Rwanda are located outside anything defined as a forest, be it the national, the natural forest or the savanna and uh, shrubland, which in the current national definition also is classified as forest. 
but we could also tell how many trees are in any um, ecosystem. So here we have, for instance, eucalyptus plantations, which contain about 17% of all trees. Um, and then we have also the rainforest, we have farmland, we have um, shrubland um, and also savanna. Um, yeah, so we could tell where is the highest density, how big are the trees inside there. So after we've done this, then we um, wanted to estimate the carbon stock and biomass, as uh, Florian mentioned. So we developed, we, we of course, the allometric relationships here we, with the field measurements. And here we use different types of field measurements, including the National Forest Inventory. And this is important because by collaborating with the, uh, the government authorities to access the National Forest Inventory, we could verify and calibrate our methods for the national uh, estimates of the biomass and carbon stock. So that's what we did. And then after we've done that, we could also map uh, the biomass and carbon stock for every tree. So now we have the map of the country with all trees with the um, um, amount of biomass and carbon stock within every tree. And we can also present the statistics of what's available in every ecosystem. So natural forests, savanna and shrubland, eucalyptus plantations, non-eucalyptus plantation, farmland, and urban uh, areas. Um, there is a graph that I didn't put here, but actually we also compare with existing global products because we have many global biomass products, but um, we could see that some of them underestimate um, uh, inside the natural forest because of how close the forest is and overestimates outside of forest because when you look at a one hectare outside of a dense forest you don't only see trees but also other sorts of biomass so it's like from grassland or for instance perennial agriculture but here we discern uh, from different types of uh, biomass and here we concentrate only on trees so here it was not only in Rwanda, but we also wanted to upscale the method to the East African countries. And here, um, the other countries like Uganda, Kenya, Tanzania, Burundi, also we tried our method using different types of images. These are from SkySat. SkySat is also uh, a type of product. It's 50 centimeter resolution from Planet uh, Labs uh, that Florian presented. Um, and here we uh, acquired these images in different countries and we wanted to see if the method would work there. So the method uh, was transferable. We didn't do any fine tuning for the model we trained in Rwanda. And in East Africa, and we can see that we had a very good correlation, about 84%. So the method is transferable. So what we wanted to do after that, we wanted to see, can we move to the monitoring, not one-time mapping? So for that, we acquired images from Rwanda Space Agency from 2019. The images are a bit different from what we used in 2008 because they are satellite images uh, from what view and it's also 50 centimeter. And um, so they, they are a bit of um, pre-processing required so that the images look similar. That's what took a bit of time. But in the end, we could see that now we can compare areas and now we can see where trees have appeared in these last 11 years and how big are they and how much of carbon stock is in the new trees. So here uh, we were focusing only on the new trees. And here we took an example in agri agriculture and also a degraded natural forest because these two uh, ecosystems are mainly targeted by the restoration efforts. And here we could see how many trees have been increasing in farmlands and also in degraded natural forest. This example that I just gave here, it's uh, uh, the top, the bottom right is in a degraded natural forest while the lower left is uh, from um, a farmland, but also we have some eucalyptus plantations there. So, and yeah, of course in the plantations and um, farmlands, trees tend not to have a lot of biomass and carbon stock because of the heavy management like pruning for fuel wood um, and, and, and so, and other management like usage for the agricultural activities and so, and so on. So yeah, and then we could derive some of the statistics. 
yeah so that's uh, that's about it that's what we've done uh, from uh, mapping one time at individual tree scale to estimating carbon and biomass and and then also to the monitoring side for the comparability of the images of course because even if the images are different you may end up mapping something different which is not necessarily the reality on the ground so um yeah so here we have two tools before we conclude that we can um, uh, experiment with. The first one is the tree viewer that Martin mentioned in the first presentation, where uh, you can zoom in in uh, many about 10 countries in northern dryland. Uh, you have also the subhumid part um, of the region of the region. And um, yeah, that's the first tool. So uh, I'm not sure how we are going to do that, but we can um uh, if you uh sorry if you copy um this link in the browser uh maybe we can get a, maybe one minute or two to do that and then we can experiment together so the second tool is the viewer of the tree changes in rwanda where you can zoom to an area and then you can see how many trees are there um, individually. So we can paste this in different tabs and then we can have a few minutes experimenting, but also probably asking questions. Um, so we can do both Q&A session as we also explore the tool, if that sounds okay. Um, yeah.
if you, if you, 